Tonight on CTV News, police raid two properties today as they step up their campaign to shut down gangs. We're told to live in the city, but will it be affordable? And should it stay or should it go? The fight to save the town hall is back on the council agenda. Broadcasting across Canterbury. From the CTV studio, this is First at Five. Good evening to you. Police are at the scene of a serious crash tonight involving two vehicles which occurred just before 3 o'clock this afternoon on State Highway 1 just south of St Andrews. State Highway 1 will remain closed for at least the next six hours and diversions are in place. The serious crash unit has believed to have just arrived on the scene and people are injured. Police are urging the public to avoid the area where possible and be patient as significant delays are likely. To the day's main story now, police raided two Christchurch properties today as part of an ongoing campaign to shut down gangs. The raids are part of what police say is a two-month operation targeting organised crime. But one gang expert is questioning whether the operation will have any success. It's quiet outside now, but at 8 this morning, Ironclad Securities, a debt collection agency, was a hive of activity as the armed defenders squad stormed the business owned by a patched headhunter. His home was also searched. Police say they were looking for guns, but none were found. The senior gang member has previous convictions for drug offending, and police have been investigating complaints about his debt collection company. There are at least 150 headhunter gang members around the country and a new two-month operation in Canterbury hopes to prevent more people from signing up to it and other gangs. Operation Focus launched this month. It's aimed at targeting gangs, drugs and organised crime. We've seen more gangs come into, into Canterbury recently. It's no secret Canterbury has a problem with gang-related crime. In the last few weeks, a man was beaten to death at Christchurch's men's prison by men believed to have links to gangs. And in another incident, a patched member of the mongrel mob was shot in the head. Yesterday, two arrests were made after gang-related disorder in Ashburton when a car was rammed. This isn't a reaction to that. Uh, those are inquiries that are standing there on two, on two feet. Police will be working with criminals on bail conditions and will try to redirect these people into employment and sport. They'll often tell you why they're offending. Uh, it might be they've got a drug problem, uh, there might be other issues there. However, a leading expert on gangs warns unless the members receive support after the two-month programme wraps up, they could return to the gang. The problems that we're dealing with here often have a genesis, which is decades old. Uh, you know, intergenerational issues we're dealing with. Um, we're not going to solve those overnight. They require very, very long-term thinking and planning. Oh, definitely, and I would agree with them about that. It's not a, it's not a five-minute job to, to change people's views on life. Um, it's about working with them longer term. Because a lot of people actually do want to reduce their offending and not be continually talking to the police. Police are confident this preventative approach will work and the number of gang members in Canterbury will fall. They're definitely uh, the harder sell, um, but we do find that uh, some of the longer time gang members uh, are sick of it, you know, they've got families and they do want to make changes in their lives. However, the university's gang expert isn't convinced two months is a long enough period for police to make inroads into the gang. Look, a two month time frame is very, very short. You're not going to make the types of changes um, that are required in that time, what it may do um, is give police um, some insight into how they can move forward into the, the medium and long. Police do admit it can be a challenge to convert gang members away from a life of crime. They say it's easier to work with some of the younger members than the seasoned criminals. Uh, it's not an easy sell for us. Um, and it it's really comes down to the individual and it's not so much the gangs we, we target, it's, it's the individuals. And it's, it's about breaking that influence in their lives. Police are two weeks into the eight-week programme and say results won't show for another six to 12 months. However, Detective Senior Sergeant Greg Cottom hopes crime will be down. Marcus Gibbs, CTV News. Well, if you're one of the thousands of homeowners potentially dissatisfied with your EQC repair offer, you only have seven more weeks to make up your mind. Homeowners who are yet to accept EQC repair work will have seven weeks to take the offer. The June 1st deadline has been announced today in a bid by the Commission to get the few thousand homeowners still unsatisfied by their EQC offers to make a decision. The deadline won't affect properties affected by increased flooding vulnerability as these claims will be dealt with separately. 
It also won't affect homeowners who have already come to an agreement with EQC but are yet to have work started on their properties. EQC says homeowners who don't respond or can't be contacted by the deadline will be excluded from the Canterbury Home Repair Program and likely be given a cash settlement instead. The Commission will be opening an in-the-know support hub at the Eastgate Shopping Centre in Linwood from the 20th of April as a support service for answering post-quake questions. Well, we're all being enticed to move back into Central Christchurch, aren't we? Well, the eastern frame of the Christchurch CBD has been earmarked for new residential properties. But the questions are, will they be attractive and will they actually be affordable? Jared McCulloch reports. There's been a lot of new buildings popping up around Central Christchurch, many of them business hubs, restaurants and bars. But one developer says it's time for people to make the central city their new home. Sean Stockman is the man behind some of the structures going up, having been involved in multiple rebuilds within the four avenues, Strangers Lane and High Street and Kensington House and Manchester Street to name a couple. But he says to have a vibrant heart of a city, you need people to live there. It's all happening, it's all, it's all going to come together. If you wind the clock forward in two years, you're going to have a very, very different city. Uh, and you know, the, the proposed uh, residential precinct, which is over on the east frame through here, um, you know, will add to that. And it's what he would like to see next. He's been supporting the central city development, helping to bring work and social life back to the CBD. But there's a slight problem. There's no effort to buy right now, not centre city. There is on the peripheral of the city, there's some development happening. Uh, but that, that it, it will, the opportunity will come up. He says something needs to be done soon so people don't decide to leave the city. However, it won't be like this for much longer, with the land for residential communities being allocated on the green frame. Plans have been designed over the last couple of years, with this urban village project Breathe being drafted up by builders and architects from here and overseas. The section on this image shows the area where construction will be for new homes on the east and north frames, likely to house around 2,000 people. And he believes the focus should be on the younger generation, encouraging them to enter back into the new CBD. I'd love to see the, 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 you know, the, thir the people in their 20s and 30s living back here, working here, you know, playing here, you know, it'll say entertaining, you know, their entertainment's here and being part of it. He says it'll be rather exciting seeing the new homes go up within the four halves, compared to the mainly older style building accommodation in the central city before the quakes. The residential that was there was more or less an old building, so it was the high power building and we had various buildings through the CBD that had apartments on the top floor uh, because at some stage you couldn't lease them so it was easy to convert them to apartments and you know, find a use for them. But he says the government has made housing opportunities for people to get back in the new Christchurch city with spaces reserved in the blueprint. You know, taking that land through the east frame and earmarking it for residential. And of course it does come to cost and Stockman says it's likely to be more affordable. If you wanted to live centre city, you know, it was a $2 million apartment I'd look overlooking Victoria Square or Victoria Street at one and a half million or the west side of town over here, which has always been more, you know, expensive. So I think these ones over here, they won't be bargain basement prices, but they'll be a lot more affordable than what we've had previously. And he says developments of these buildings are likely to start in a year's time. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. Well, still to come here on CTV News, Councillor Jamie Goff joins me to discuss, wait for it, the future of the Christchurch Town Hall. Kids Television is right here on CTV. Tune in every Saturday from 7am to 8am for an exciting range of fantastic kids programming. Join in with all the fun, Saturday mornings from 7am to 8am on CTV. At Bowden Environmental, we specialise in all aspects of resource management so you don't have to deal with the paperwork. With the skills and knowledge to organise any environmental work, we can guide you through the process from start to finish. From organising consents and farm environmental plans to pump and well testing, Bowden Environmental has it covered. Save time and remove the stress. See the specialist. Bowden Environmental. Computer not working? Replace or repair? DIY or get a technician? Looking for parts? Thinking of upgrading? Need accessories? 
You've got questions, we've got answers. Global PC. Come on down to Fairy Mead Golf. Care for a game of paintball? How about some swings on the old driving range? Or on our par three nine hole golf course? Test your skills on the mini golf course or have a go at the air gun shooting range. Then relax at the Wow Cafe with one of our super succulent Wow Burgers. Whether you want to perfect your swing or are looking for a fun family day out, come down to Ferrymead Golf, 50 Ferrymead Park Drive, right next to the Ferrymead Heritage Park. Arts 21 showcases the vast creative talent and minds that are making a name for themselves in Europe and beyond. Think outside the square with Arts 21. Welcome back to CTV News. Love it or hate it? The Christchurch Town Hall is set to become the city's next rebuild debate. I certainly hope not. It was insured for less than half the likely cost of repairing it, and the council is about to find out the cost and what its future will be. Well, joining me to discuss this is Christchurch City Councillor Jamie Goff. Good evening, Jamie. Good evening. Get rid of it. Well, do we need mm -hmm. it? It's an eyesore. Yeah, well, that sounds a lot like my, uh, my argument last term, but um, mm. I unfortunately lost that argument. So my, my view was that, look, it was insured for 70 million or 69. 9.5 mm. or thereabouts. Um, my personal view was that, particularly with experience and property pre council, these sort of heritage restoration jobs generally go one direction cost wise, and it's that way. That worried me. Mm. Why not repair the auditorium and get rid of the rest? It's See, a bit I, of a dog anyway. Well, yeah, I was of the opinion this building's going though. Leanne Dalzell said no, that's not the case. You were going to go out and, and, and put your feelers out for people who wanted to, this building to be kept. Correct. So, what is the situation now? Where are we actually at as of this evening? Well, the council made a decision, which of course I, I lost that vote on, but I do respect the view of the collective. The council decision was that they repair it at a cost of $128 million. So they've gone out seeking tenders and people to put their hands up and say, yeah, we believe that we can do it for this price. So does this mean that it, it's not a foregone conclusion? Are we keeping this or not? Oh, look, you, you've never necessarily gone too far down the wrong path to turn back. Nothing's, nothing's done until it's, uh, <laughs> until it's absolutely done and dusted. So you, you, we, you certainly haven't passed the point of no return with, with many things in this rebuild. Well, that's what I thought, because when I was speaking to Raf Menji on this programme not too long ago, he said to me, um, yes, they're going to probably seek expressions of interest, but uh, the, the, the current council, like yourself and the other councillors, you've not ratified this deal, which means uh, you don't necessarily have to save this building. Um, yeah, but you, you can't go through and ratify every decision that a past council has ever made you generally truck on with that. I am a big believer in the fact that the best thing you can do is make the right decision, the next best thing is probably the wrong decision, but the worst thing you can possibly do is make no decision at all. So instead of running around like headless chooks doing nothing, uh, while I didn't agree with the decision to repair the whole entire thing, mm. I do actually respect the view that they uh, that they reached a decision, and I'm not a councillor that wants to kick sand in the eyes of everyone scoring own goals and undermining past decisions. Although I didn't agree with it, I had my chance, I lost it, that's fine. Now we've been dealt some cards, I want to get the best value that we can. I want to ensure that those costs are locked down, I want to ensure that the tenderers, or whoever is tendered for it, or the winning tender, uh, they have skin in the game. I want to make sure that it's not going to cost the ratepayer more. And I hope I'm proven wrong. I don't want those costs to blow out, but I fear that they might. And if they do, I want them to be fixed costs. Otherwise, I'd, I, I just can't support it. Earlier today on Facebook, you asked um, your followers what they thought about whether or not to keep this thing. Uh, what, was, <laughs> what was their response? What are they saying? What are they telling you? Uh, it was a bit of a mixed bag. Um, but I, I think probably the... Um, uh, I, haven't, I haven't looked at it recently, but um, I think the majority were, were saying just ditch it and move on. If we don't ditch it and we don't move on, don't we then run the risk of the Performing Arts Precinct not having as much cash as possible? Now how does mm -hmm. that actually work? No, oh, absolutely. Well, th there is there is money which is available for a Performing Arts Precinct. The vast majority of that is going to be tied up in the restoration of the $128 million Town Hall restoration. My fear is that if those costs blow out, then there's a whole lot left in the kitty for the wider Performing Arts Precinct. So my preference would have been, you've got $69 million worth of insurance available. Why not put that into repairing for $70 million, the auditorium, which did have world-class acoustics. It's Sir Miles Warren's, you know, that, that, that is the, that is the yes. gem in the crown. If you kept that, mm. then why not have a performing arts precinct that actually complemented everything else? Yeah. The Isaac Theatre Royal is the same size as the James Hay Theatre, so why have something which oh. is 
And as uh, for the James Hay Fieser... Yeah, well, it, was, it, was, it looked crap, it had crap acoustics. Mm. Why would you put millions and millions into repairing something which is about the same size as the Isaac Theatre Royal? So do we have any tentative dates as to when we'll have a final decision on this monstrosity? <laughs> <laughs> look, I'm not as cynical about it as you. I do understand that, uh, look, if a decision's been made, I'm not there to undermine it. I do want to make sure that we get the best bang for our buck, though. Um, Look, uh, we'll have to see when this business case comes through because that will have the timelines associated with it. Um, mm. But you, I just want to get on, get on with it. You know, um, yeah. there, there, there's so much to be done. But uh, but bickering amongst ourselves, you know, I look at the cathedral and everything like that. I'm over it. I'm getting over a whole lot of things when we end up running around the circles. Oh well, I hope this is not going to be the next um, rebuild discussion because I think we need to just move on with things. However, let me ask you about the the council um, long term plan. Any feedback on whether or not people are being engaged in that? Process. Now, the reason why I ask you that, I had it on the uh, ECAN commissioner on CDV News last week. He said to me, only 150 people have bothered to put in submissions. Now, I take it perhaps the reason being is uh, why bother um, you know, signing papers for non-elected representatives? You are elected, though. Do you think people are a more supportive or more engaged in the Christchurch City Council long-term plan than they are with old ECAN down the road. Well, I don't want to have a popularity contest and say that we're sexier ECAN. than ECAN, but, um, uh, well, clearly we are. But, um, are you? Well, I'd like to think so. We have got elected representatives there as opposed to uh, commissioners, so uh, I do feel that perhaps people feel more engaged because they've actually got skin in the game. They yeah. elected people that sit around that table, um, rightly or wrongly. So um, I, I think the interest has been quite high. I, I actually feel that ever since the earthquake, People are, are taking a keener engaged. interest in their city, they are. Which, is, which is a great thing. Councillor Jamie Goff, appreciate your time tonight. My pleasure. Uh, while Redcliffe School awaits a decision about its future, on the other side of town, Education Minister Hikia Parata was on hand today to mark the second stage of the Marshland School rebuild. And our reporter, Jared McCulloch, was there. Construction is well underway at this site, preparing and making way for a brand new primary school. Education Minister Hikia Parata marked the next phase of construction by turning off the sod. The new school will cost $15.7 million, but this is just one of the future learning environments around the city. The government is committing over $1.1 billion over 10 years to be spent on repairing and rebuilding Christchurch schools. And one member of the Board of Trustees says it's great to see the project underway. To actually see this thing actually happening, it's yeah, it's amazing to be part of it. It's yeah, it's brilliant. I can just yeah, it's just gonna be brilliant for the kids. Reeves has been part of the rebuild process since the start, back in March 2014, when the school was confirmed by the Ministry of Education for funding of a brand new facility. And he says it's been great to help work through the new school process. Right at the very start, being part of the whole design, the um, the build options, just the thoughts and processes of like what do they want in the new school. Marshlands. School school is still operating from its current site on Preston's Road, just over 600 metres down from their new location here. The existing site experienced a lot of damage from the earthquakes, entitling them to receive a complete rebuild. Anne Reeves says it's more than just destruction from the quakes. A lot of it's to do with the flooding and the, and the surge and so forth like that. Another great aspect for it was that you know, it's just so close. We don't have to actually keep teaching the same site. It's a case that the site is what it is. The kids are still learning there, but just down the road, there's this whole new thing happening. And the children were excited too, not bothered at all that their school holidays were being disrupted, but some of the school turning out today. Presently, I think we're about 240 odd. Um, by the end of this year, it's going to go 280, um, which is just purely by the people and the developments around here. And when it's completed, it'll be able to cater for 400 students. And with an extension, it could see the school accommodate 650. It's well short of the role at the moment, but the Education Minister says it's all about future proofing. Well, that's certainly the pr um, predicted population growth in this area. It's really important that when we're building a new school, we're building not just for the current population, but for what the projected population is. And this community is very confident and the data supports it. It's expected students will be entering modern day learning here at this site at the start of next year, with a transition period over the Christmas break. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. And Hekia Parata will join us on Lynched on Monday night. Still to come here on CTV News, the weekend sports preview and your region's weather. When you need to know what's happening in your region of Canterbury, join me, Chris Lynch, for CTV News First at Five, weeknights from five, right here on your local channel, CTV. Computer not working? 
replace or repair. DIY or get a technician. Looking for parts. Thinking of upgrading? Need accessories? You've got questions, we've got answers. Global PC. The preparation. The devotion. The fearlessness. The intensity. Runway model management. First impressions are everything. Sinclair and the team at Gone Fishing as they bring you great stories, fishing tips and beautiful scenery. Gone Fishing, Friday night at 8.30, right here on CTV. Welcome back to CTV News. Now here's Gord's with the weekend sports preview. Life in the ANZ Netball Championship doesn't get any easier for the mainland tactics this weekend, with a match-up against the competition leaders awaiting them at Blenheim. Sunday night's opposition, the West Coast Fever, are unbeaten in their campaign, with five wins and a draw under their belt. After Monday's blowout loss to the Southern Steel, many will be predicting another one-sided affair, while the tactics will be looking to make amends for their last display and make things difficult for the table toppers. That match in Blenheim gets underway at 10 past 7. Well, to basketball now, where the Canterbury Rams face a tough test tonight when they take on the Southland Sharks in their third match of the NBL season. After starting their season with a win and a loss, the Rams have the perfect opportunity to show their intent for this season against a very strong Southland side. The Sharks, coached by the recently appointed New Zealand national team coach Paul Hanare, have three current New Zealand Breakers players, while the side won the NBA title in 2013 and made last year's playoffs. Tip-off at Cal Stadium is 7 o'clock tonight. The Hawkins Cup Metro Rugby Comp hits week three tomorrow. Last year's Hawkins Trophy winners High School Old Boys will be looking for their first win of the season when they take on Christchurch at Christchurch Park. Table toppers and defending cup winners Lincoln University are at home to Burnside, while fellow table toppers New Brighton take on Shirley at Burwood Park. Marist Albion host Belfast, Sumner host Sydenham at St Leonard's, while Linwood will be looking for three straight wins to start their season when they play University at Linfield Park. And finally tonight, the Southern Derby takes place at AMI Stadium tomorrow night when the Crusaders clash with the Highlanders. Both teams come into the match in form, with the Highlanders sitting just one competition point above the Crusaders in the Super Rugby competition. The Crusaders will be hoping for a repeat of round two in this year's competition, which saw them prevail 26 points to 20 over the Highlanders in Dunedin. A win tomorrow would make it seven in a row over our southern rivals, equaling their longest streak. Kickoff is at 7.35. You're up to date with the latest in local sport. I'm Gordon Finlater for CTV Sport. Now it's time for your region's weather. 
Good evening, Cantry. It's Friday. Let's take a look at your weather. Timaru, Tamuka and Geraldine, you're all on 13 today. Ashburton, slightly warmer on 14. Methven, even warmer, 15 degrees. Rakaia, 14 degrees for you. Taking a look at Darfield, Leiston and Rolleston now, you all hit a high of 15. Lincoln and Christchurch, very similar picture, 15 degrees. Over in Akara today, you're also sitting on 15 degrees. Taking a look at North Canterbury now, Kaiapoi, Rangiola and Ambly, you're all on 16 degrees. Colverdon, Hamner Springs and Cheviot, you all shared a high of 17. Kaikoura, 17 for you too. Let's take a look at tomorrow's weather now. Timaru will be a cloudy, cold Saturday ahead with some northeasterly winds developing later on. Tonight's low is 7, tomorrow's high 14 degrees. There'll be plenty of low cloud in Ashburton tomorrow with a chilly northeasterly breeze expected for you. Your overnight low is 7, tomorrow's high 14. As for Christchurch, there'll be some southwesterly winds at first, but they'll change to northeasterly later, and the skies will remain mostly cloudy, and the temperatures will be rather cold all day. Tonight's low is 7. Your high tomorrow is 14. A cloudy cold start for UK colder tomorrow with some northeasterly winds developing. Your overnight low is 7. Your high tomorrow, 14 degrees. Let's take a look at the other areas around the region now. Tamuka and Geraldine, a cloudy day ahead, 15. Methvin and Rakai, a similar picture too, but slightly cooler on 14 degrees. Darfield, Leeston, Rolleston and Lincoln, a cloudy day also on 14. Over in Akarao tomorrow, some cloudy skies for you on 14. Further north to Kaiapoi, Rangiola and Amberley, expect some cloudy skies ahead for you and a temperature of 14. As for Colden, Hamner Springs and Sheviot, some thick cloud at first, but that will die away in the afternoon, just leaving you with some cloudy patches here and there on 14. Looking ahead for Canterbury now, it'll be a much warmer day on Sunday with some sunny periods. Hooray, high cloud for you and some fresh northerly winds. They'll get stronger as the day goes on. As for Monday, it'll be cloudy with some frequent showers here and there and very cold to wrap up warm. There'll also be some strong southerly winds as well. Expect snow too to 400 metres on the ranges. And looking ahead to Tuesday, some wintry showers with hail possible. Snow also to 400 metres expected and strong gale force winds. Expect that Tuesday night too. As for Wednesday, that will disappear and there'll be just some cloud and showers and some southwesterly winds. But as for Thursday, that little change will be mostly fine with some sunny periods here and there, but just some moderate southwesterly winds expected. But for now, that is your weather for Friday. And that is CDV News. Have a great weekend. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.